Peter Blexley is a former detective and was a founding member of SO10, Scotland Yard's most secretive under undercover squad, where he worked to bring drug barons, contract killers, and arms traders to justice. Since leaving the Met, Blexley has appeared in Hunted on Channel 4, written several books, and created a BBC podcast series on his hunt for fugitive Kevin Park. Please, can you all join me in wishing uh, Peter a very warm welcome. Thank you. Um, Theo, President, um, Officers of the Union, thank you very much indeed for having me here this evening, and President-elect William, for giving me this afternoon the most brilliant tour of Durham I could possibly have imagined. And alcohol was not involved. <laughs> and it's not often that I say something was brilliant when there was no alcohol consumed. In my it, was, it was truly wonderful. No need to apologise. And thank you all very much for having me here. Um, so I'll kind of start at the beginning, if I may. Um, no, I'll start off with an apology. Because here you are, these bright, young, nimble minds who studied through COVID, suffered through COVID, you've gone through GCSEs, A-levels, all that kind of stuff, to come to this wonderful seat of learning only for an old, fat, grey-haired bloke turn up, who I suspect most of you have no idea who I am. Well, anyway, by the end of the evening, I hope to have changed that a little bit. I'm on a 35 minute, so I'm watching the clock. If you see me looking at the clock, it's not because I'm disinterested, it's because we're up against it. So I'll start at the beginning. Um, born in 19 room in, um, in Bexley East, South East London. Hey. Um, hey. <laughs> and, um, and essentially the product of a single parent family, my wonderful mum, who's still with us at the age of 95, bless her soul, I adore her. Um, my violent alcoholic father had gone by the time I was about 10 or 11 years old, and it was good riddance to bad rubbish at the time. Um, Mum couldn't afford to keep the house on. That got sold. We moved into a flat in Bexley Heath. Uh, my sister went off to nursing, and I went off the rails. Um, I kind of flunked my education, unlike everybody in this room, so congratulations to you all. Um, and I left school at the age of 16, with two or three O-levels, or one CSE as they were called in those days. I wasn't bright enough to be put forward for the O-level maths. They made me take a CSE, so be it. Um, and I was glad to see the back of school at the age of 16, and school were very glad to see the back of me. Um, I got a job, as you could in those days, fairly easily, really, if the truth be known, as a warehouseman at Woolworths. I'm sure, well, do any of you remember Woolworths? Anybody from your childhood? It closed down a long time ago. It used to be a sort of store where you could get pretty much anything you want, but it, uh, it didn't survive, but it, used, it was a bastion of the high street for decades. Uh, and I was a warehouseman in there, and I loved it. There was plenty of overtime, and I liked the work environment, working with adults, and all of that. And then one night, I came home, and to my absolute horror, there was an enormous uniformed police officer sitting in the lounge of the flat that I shared with Mum. And my first thought was, oh shit, what am I going to get nicked for? Because <laughs> I had rather foolishly gone off the rails and partaken shamefully in petty crime, which I won't elaborate here, but it was juvenile, it was petty, it was stupid. Um, fortunately, my mum had slightly higher aspirations for me than working in the warehouse at Woolworths and she had invited this local Bobby, a beat Bobby, to come round and sell the idea to me of joining the police cadets because at the time I was still 16. He did a marvellous job. He pointed out to me the variety of policing which still exists to this day. So should any of you by any chance think of joining law enforcement, you can do so much in the cops. And I'm almost repeating verbatim what this cop said to me all those years ago. If you like dogs, you can be a dog handler. If you like horses, horses, I can't remember Bexley either, I didn't, barely knew what horses looked like, let alone ever, ever ridden one, you can go in Meredith Branch. 
If you like boats, there's a marine division called Thames Division. If you like diving, you can become a diver, underwater search team. If you like catching criminals, you can become a detective, catch murderers if you want. If you like terrorism and the politics of policing, go in a special branch. And on and on and on he went. <coughs> and I thought, sounds like fun. He said, you're only 16 kids, so you'll have to go in the cadets first. But if you go in the cadets, you'll play sport most of the time. A bit of classroom, a lot of discipline, a lot of marching around the drill square. Why don't you do it? And he pulled out the forms. And he'd done such a great job in selling the idea to me that I filled out the forms there and then. And a few short weeks later, I walked through the gates of Hendon Cadet College in North London with a haircut that I thought was short enough, and I found out on day one it wasn't short enough, and I got sent off for another one. And then all of a sudden, that was my first inkling of, of this discipline, which I guess I'd craved, um, and hadn't had anywhere. I'd been disrespectful of teachers. we would had a very prickly kind of relationship. Um, there were no male role models for me to look up to. There weren't uncles around that I could connect with. Um, and then all of a sudden, this 17-year-old, as I was, I'd just turned my 17th birthday, was going to PE lessons and being taught by sergeants who were former Royal Marines and had got into policing as their second career and then they'd gone into the specialisation of keeping or making young people fit in the cadets. And so if I leant against the wall, as we were queuing to go into the gymnasium, and one of the sergeants went, Blexley, down to 10, press-ups, of course. The option of saying, or what, wasn't there. Because or what means they would have turned you into a crowd within the blink of an eye. And I mean it, they'd have dragged you into the dojo, the judo gymnasium, and they'd have taught you a lesson or three about respect and discipline, standing to attention and not leaning on walls. And for me, as an unruly kid, I lapped it up. I absolutely loved it. And I embraced it and I studied hard, got another three O levels, played loads of sports, spent a year at Hendon, and suddenly I got made a vice house captain which was kind of like remarkable with the short journey I'd made in that time to embracing discipline. I know it's not for everybody, but for me, it really worked. I got sent out to a police station for six months as a cadet, so I made a lot of tea, um, but I also caught some burglars and had a few roll arounds with people and, you know, kind of thoroughly enjoyed it. So at the age of 18 and a half, I got to the other end of the policing estate to become a, a police constable, and of course I loved it. Sailed through the training, top of the class, won the book prize, all that stuff, and then I get posted to Peckham in South East London. Now, if I thought I'd been a bit of a jack the lad around Bexley, you know what I mean? Bit of petty crime, bit of this, bit of that, bit of football hooliganism, I'm jack the lad. Well, when I got to Peckham, I discovered that I was a complete marshmallow by comparison, because there was a lot of really, really tough people in Peckham. Tough criminals, tough police officers. It was very, very challenging. And again, I embraced it. Unfortunately, I embraced the real dark downside of late 80s, late 70s, early 80s policing and in South East London, Peckham, that had a large Afro-Caribbean population. What do I mean? Yes, racism in all its ugly, repulsive variations. Essentially, if you had the great misfortune to be a young black man living in Peckham or Brixton, our neighbouring division, and your face didn't fit, or you were deemed to have failed the attitude test, or you were suspected of crime, then in all likelihood, you would be fitted up and beaten up. Yes, I'm sorry to say that was the harsh, uncomfortable truth of the late 70s 
and here are the ages. Rampant, repugnant racism. I, as a foolish, immature, young, impressionable man, who makes no excuses, got sucked into it, in so much as that I became a vile racist myself. And that was a matter, and has been a matter, of deep shame, but I've apologised for it publicly, in television programmes, in radio documentaries, in written articles, many, many times, because I didn't have that attitude for very long, because in April of 1981, whilst I'm still in uniform, I was part of what then was called a divisional support unit, basically a people carrier, a van full of uniformed cops. We would police hotspots, and, and it was pretty uncomplicated at the time. And on a Friday afternoon, a shout went up, urgent assistance, route and road, Brixton. We were at Camberwell, mile from there, boom, whack the two tones on, next to no time, we're there. Mountain Road, again, very large Afro-Caribbean population, community, um, known as the front line, have been subjected to a lot of pretty repugnant <coughs> policing over the years. In fact, Brixton Police Station at the time had an operation going on called Operation Swamp. And you can pretty much gather what that was from the uncomplicated title of it. They swamped the streets, and if it moved, you stopped and searched it. That was basically it. And all that had done in the preceding weeks was crank up the resentment. It <coughs> cranked it up, it cranked it up. And on that Friday afternoon, a young black man got stabbed in the back. Police officers attended, and in an effort to stem the bleeding, one of the uniformed police officers knelt on the back of the stabbing victim. But this, of course, by a population, by a community that didn't trust the police, perceived it as this stabbing victim being detained. The tension was palpable. Things got thrown. We turned up. There was a bit of a standoff. The tension grew, and it grew, and it grew. And more and more officers turned up. And it was kind of quelled for that Friday evening, just about. But it really was a tinderbox. Some stupid clown of a senior police officer at Brixton came up with the policy of us in a large convoy driving round endlessly in a loop. For any of you familiar with that part of, of South East London, it was from, from sort of route and, route and Road all the way down to Tulse Hill, bunger right and then back up. And then just keep going around in that loop. Do not get out of your vehicles. Do not stop and search anybody. Go around in this loop endlessly all night. And what did that do? <coughs> Nothing, apart from crank up the tension. We saw people carrying crates of milk bottles down in the basement flats. We knew what was going on. They were going to be used as petrol bottles. We could tell that because the tension was so high. Sadly, we were proved right. But we did that round and round and round Friday night so we eventually got stood down in the early hours. Called back there on the Saturday, some sparked it, and Brixton burnt that weekend. People threw everything they possibly could at us, including petrol bombs and bricks, and whatever they could lay their hands on, and many would say, with ample justification. Because that's what happens when a community is oppressed for a very long time. They are going to fight back eventually. And that's what many of the residents of Brixton did that dreadful, dreadful weekend in April 1981. I saw that people wanted to kill me, not because of who I was, they didn't know me, because of what I represented, and of course the fact, yes, if they'd have known that, like so many of my peers at that time in that part of London, we were vile, repugnant, racist, but, so, it was one heck, of a, one heck of a day that Saturday, watching buildings literally tumble to the ground because they'd been ablaze for hours. And I got home to my mum's. Um, didn't go back on the Sunday, it wasn't required on the Sunday. But on the Sunday, when I kind of looked in the mirror, 
contemplated what had happened the previous two days, realised what a complete and utter arse I was, I realised there were a couple of things. Number one, that I had to change, and number two, that my role had to change. Because if I was changing, I no longer wanted to wear the cloth that was the symbol of <coughs> oppression. Because I was no longer, as far as I was concerned, going to be the oppressor. And I'm not asking for plaudits, on the contrary, I don't deserve any. I'm just telling you a fact that since then, in April 1981, and to this very day, I've never committed a racist deed or said a racist word. And that's how it is. I learned. Um, yeah. So, not long after that, just to lighten the mood a little bit, without being disrespectful to the past, um, yeah, I didn't want to wear a uniform, so I was lucky enough to be accepted into the CID, past the selection board, all of that, and in 1982, I got posted from South East London, Peckham, to the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which was a bit of a contrast from Peckham, believe you me. And I experienced a lot of different crime there, lots of drug offences. We're now talking about the early 80s. I was there till 1985, into the mid 80s, the explosion of cocaine onto the streets of Britain. Dealt with a lot of cocaine cases. Um, murders and all that sort of stuff. And then the next natural progression, by the time we've got to 1985, I'm 25, I'm young, fit and fearless. Do I go for promotion? Nah, nah, I'm not having promotion, I didn't want any of that. Or do I go for specialism? Yes, so I try and become a Scotland Yard detective. That's the next best thing to kind of to, to do, if you're like me, interested in crime. I was very fortunate to be selected for the Central Drug Squad, which in 1985 was the Met Police's premier drug fighting unit. Okay? I'm sorry if this all sounds like a bloody history lesson, but I'm that old. 1985, on the other side of the pond, Ronald Reagan is banging on about the war on drugs. His wife, Nancy Reagan, starts the single least successful PR campaign ever in the history of mankind. And it's called Just Say No. Right? Well, of course, and this is not true life confession time, so don't put your hands up or anything like that. Right? But millions of people around the world continue to just say yes. Oh, where's the bugle? Right? And we know they do. How do we know they do that? Because, of course, the illegal drugs industry is now the fourth biggest industry in the world. A couple of economy students were sat around the table having dinner with me tonight. Economics, so that become drug dealers. No, 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 no. It's the fourth biggest industry in the world. It's larger than the textiles industry. And look at us, I'm pleased to say, we've all got clothes on. <laughs> We're all wearing textiles. They're curtains, there's curtains. They're textiles. You've got carpet at home. Textiles. The drugs industry is bigger than the textiles industry. It's everywhere. We've got narco states, we've got millions of people, <coughs> joyously, happily, hoovering up tons of Charlie every weekend, Smoking bifter after bifter, trying to convince people they understand modern jazz and eating their fourth, <laughs> eating their fourth box of Maltesers. Right? We know it. Everybody's on it. Everyone's doing it. And I don't condone it. I don't encourage it. Because I've been that broke in the room on Charlie who thinks I'm the most interesting bloke in the room. <laughs> Whereas in reality, I'm the most tediously freaking boring bloke in the room, right? Some of you may be familiar with those kind of people. Right? It's nonsense. I don't encourage it. I don't condone it. I haven't touched a bit of gear for 20 years. And my life has never been happier. But anyway... I digress. Where was I? Oh yeah, I was at Scotland. Yeah, I was on the drug squad. Yeah. 
And then I first experienced properly, officially, how Scotland Yard did undercover operations. I thought, I'll have a bit of this. I thought, oh, I'll have a bit of this. It was all very uncomplicated at the time. There was no official recruitment, training, selection, none of that. It was just like, who fancies having a go? Me, me, go. I'll have a go, I'll have a go, I'll have a go. And so I did. And then I spent over a decade working undercover, buying millions upon millions of pounds worth of drugs, many, many guns, lorry loads, lorry load of trainers that might have been hijacked, lorry load of whiskey that might have been hijacked, all that sort of stuff. Negotiating with the criminals, convincing them that I was one of them, and trying to get them to bring the gear onto the plot so they could be arrested, and invariably they were. And occasionally, uh, profession to be an assassin, a hitman, if there was a wife wanted her husband murdered, if there was a business associate wanted a rival taken out and we got to hear of it and an introduction was effected to an informant, then I would step forward, perhaps alongside a colleague, and pretend to be the assassins. We'd gather all the evidence of the plot to murder, make sure that it was actually a nailed on proper plot and not somebody just having this fanciful notion that actually when it comes to it, they might live to regret. <coughs> make sure it was proper, invariably with a 50% deposit in cash paid up front, because that was a definite sign of their intent. And then of course they would be arrested and stand trial for conspiracy to murder and be convicted. So I did this for just over 10 years, travelled widely, not only throughout the UK, but abroad, training, lecturing, all that kind of stuff. Went to the FBI headquarters in Quantico in Virginia, worked with their undercover people and the Whitecaps uh, staff who were kind of like military training to go down to South America and blow up the cocaine factories. Many of them didn't come back. Um, and all of that, because we thought we were on the side of the angels and we were doing our bit in the war on drugs. What an absolute nonsense. Because of course now, looking back and with the life experience that I've got, the war on drugs is simply a war that cannot and will not ever be won. And I'm conscious that I've only got 10 minutes or so. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you please to use your imaginations. Could you kindly imagine, this bit's not hard by the way, that it's Monday the 16th of October 2023. We all with that? We all got that, right? That's not difficult to imagine. This is a bit more challenging. Please bear with me. Imagine that I've got a white coat on and that I'm a government scientist, okay? Now, I need, because I'm at, I'm at uh, 10 Downing Street and I'm making a presentation to the four highest offices of political state. So, perhaps, let's have a female Prime Minister, if we may, okay? Can't be any worse than trust, can she? Come on. <laughs> right? Sorry, no, that's good. So we've got to put, in fact, well, we'll take these four, please, if I may. So Prime Minister, Chancellor of the Exchequer, <laughs> Foreign Secretary, Home Secretary, okay? Are you Suella's brother? <laughs> Just want to check. Right. So to these, to the four most important political people in the country, in my white coat, I present to you four imaginary parcels that I, as the most eminent government scientist in regards to drugs, have just discovered. And they are cannabis, cocaine, heroin, and ecstasy. And of course, I tell you all, that within just a couple of decades or so, they will constitute the fourth biggest industry in the world, right? Remember, remember. Okay, they are going to sell billions upon billions worth of these drugs every single day of the week, right? Globally, there'll be a phenomenon. The marketing, they'll market themselves. The products will speak for themselves. <coughs> Yes, okay, there will be a percentage of users who are problematic. The hapless, sad, problematic drug users. But less in percentage terms than problematic, problematic drinkers, alcoholics, okay? 
stats. So now, I would like these to be legal and regulated and regulated, okay? If ever you're in my company and we're chatting about this, wheresoever we might bump into each other once, once again, if we're talking about legalising, we say and <laughs> regulating. So here they are, these four new products, they're going to be a global sensation, sell by the billion upon billion upon billion, who should we let market them? Who should we let sell these drugs? Prime Minister, who do you think should sell these phenomenally popular drugs and control the industry and control the market? Would it be in the Prime Minister's interest to have a government control it? Well, I certainly think so, Prime Minister. I think you're very much heading in the right direction. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. I'll shorten the conversation. Out of the four great offices of state, who of you thinks we should let criminals run this industry? Thank you. And yet that is exactly what we do. Criminals run the industry. Criminals do every drug deal. Criminals that meet you in a car park, not you, who was I looking at? I wasn't looking at anyone. <laughs> Criminals who meet drug consumers in a gloomy pub car park and will encourage those consumers to take more and more and more harmful drugs. Hence you get derivatives of cocaine, like crack of course. Hence you get drugs that come onto the market that essentially are concocted by the contents of the cupboard under your sink. Because that's what they do. They get more and more toxic. And they get more and more addictive. And why do they do that? Because like a bunch of complete and utter lunatics, we let criminals run the industry. Criminals who want you to buy more. Who when they meet you, in that gloomy pub car park, might have a knife down the back of their trousers, or a gun, and they'll want you to take more. And they won't give a damn about you, apart from rinsing you for your money, and coming back the following day and rinsing you for some more money. And of course, because the industry's going to be regulated, <coughs> that ecstasy that I spoke about, those tablets, they're not manufactured in a back street garage in a side street of Amsterdam. No, they're manufactured in a regulated, licensed, pristine factory. And when you go and buy them from my unimaginatively named drugstore on the high street, okay, I suspect it'll be the chemist, you know, the pharmacy, that's where you'll probably get them, should my dream and my wish, my desire, my vision ever come to fruition, you will get advice, whether it be written, whether it be over the counter, just like you will when you go and buy a paracetamol, because they'll be regulated and licensed, and the pharmacist will not be a criminal. So, that's my vision. I'd like to think that one day it will happen. In fact, it will, because the drug law reform movement is gaining traction all the time. Crispin Blunt MP is an absolute luminary amongst so many short-term, short-sighted politicians. And why are the politicians short-term and short-sighted? Because number one, they're scared. Number two, they don't know anything about the industry and how it works. And like many of their constituents, they have consumed their information about drugs through newspapers whose headlines have screamed since the 1970s, drugs will kill you all. And of course they don't. They kill some, but they don't go anywhere near towards killing all. Absolute opposite is true. Drugs are dangerous. Millions of people in this country, and I mean millions, take drugs, hold down responsible jobs, raise decent children who go on to contribute to society. Those headlines have been a lie. But my fictional Mrs. Miggins, who lives in a comfortable Cotswold cottage, and she's adorable, she's a lovely lady, but she's just consumed her drugs information through those screaming, incorrect headlines, thinks they're all bad. 
Her grandson comes over for Sunday lunch every other week. And of course she loves her grandson and he loves his grandma. She thinks that the reason he has three portions of apple crumble, custard, and ice cream is because he's a grubby lad. <laughs> what she doesn't realise is that when he says he's popping out to the bottom of the garden just to get a bit of fresh air, he's going behind her greenhouse having a biff to the size of a baby's arm <coughs> and he's got the munchies. That's why he has three portions. But of course, dear Mrs. Miggins, who's made that crumble, and it is amazing, <laughs> thinks that all drugs are bad and everyone's going to die and we should lock all the drug dealers up. And drug dealers constitute about 10% of the prison population. And on the day when the Justice Secretary announces <coughs> measures, I'm being polite, you know, to free up more prison space, because it's not like we've got any criminals out there running rampant, is it? You know, it's not like we've got a shoplifting epidemic with 800 retail staff being assaulted every day. It's not like See, let's lock up less people, shall we? Because the country's got so safe, hasn't it? No, we need more prison spaces and we need to lock up more people. But what we actually need to do, not drug dealers, of course, because we're going to legalise and regulate that industry, then we'll free up some space to lock up the people that need to be locked up. The people of violence, the inscrupulous, indiscriminate thieves who steal with abandon in this ever-increasingly lawless country that sadly we live in. And if any politician wants to pipe up and say, you're wrong, because the stats indicate crime's going down, that is BS. It is utter nonsense. Every day I speak to somebody who knows someone or was a victim of crime that has not been reported to the police. And I could be here for a very long time talking about the ineffectiveness of the police and all of that, but we're going to have time for questions. And if you want to ask me any questions on that subject, I'd be very happy to answer them. <coughs> and just while we're talking about prison, yes, of course, punishment without rehabilitation is an absolute waste of time. Prison sentences of up to a year are, generally speaking, a resounding waste of time. But the longer the prison estate has somebody at His Majesty's pleasure, the greater the chance of, number one, the offender challenging their behaviour, <coughs> seeing the wrongdoings of the past, putting them into some kind of context, appreciating the harm that they've done, and rehabilitating themselves. When they are in prison for a term in excess of a year, the prison estate has the opportunity to help them with all that thinking. So I'm not averse to locking up more people because I think there are plenty of people out there who need to be locked up. Yes, I know there's out of court resolutions and all of that. I have many, many sources, some of whom are senior social workers that deal with the youth of today who don't go to court for possessing a knife and come back in front of him time and time again. So many out of court <laughs> resolutions simply don't. Okay, I think I've just about <coughs> hit my time. Um, I went off a bit left field on the whole drug scene, didn't I? Think? <laughs> I didn't cover much of the other stuff I was going to talk about, but it's something which you might have gathered that I'm rather passionate about. And of course, you will be the decision makers of tomorrow. Some of you may sit in Parliament and vote. Trust me, the drug law reform movement will, I'm not going to say victorious, because it's not a, a battle, is it? They will be heard, they will be listened to, people will act accordingly. That's far more grown-up language. I'd like to think that those drugs that I presented to our clearly learned, worldly front bench, um, I'd like to think that they will be legalised and regulated in my lifetime. If not, they certainly will be in my children's lifetime. And my youngest child is a year three student at uni and not, so it will be in their lifetimes. In other words, in your lifetimes. Anyway, thank you. Sorry if it was a bit ranty and shouty, but thank you very much for paying attention. Bless you all. Thank you.